This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I thank you all uh, for joining us uh, for our lecture series event this evening. We're delighted to have uh, Rod Ferguson with us from the Bay Area. He's uh, co-founder and managing director of Panorama Capital and uh, has uh, shared a day with us of uh, a whole series of meetings and we're delighted that uh, many uh, students and uh, young entrepreneurs have had a chance to visit with him. Uh, we uh, will be going with our normal uh, process 45 to uh, 50 minutes and then we'll have uh, Q&A. Please wait for the mic on either side, and uh, then we'll uh, dive into some uh, direct questions with uh, Rod Ferguson. Thanks very much. Please join us in welcoming Rod Ferguson. Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay out there? Um, thanks for taking the time on your Thursday evening to show up. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the current environment. Uh, and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. I'm going to do this in three parts. I'm going to talk to you about being an entrepreneur and what that means and some of the aspects of that. I'm going to give you a lot of data on venture capital, which is the primary funding source in America for entrepreneurs. And then I'm going to tell you about opportunities that you might have when you get out of this great institution to uh, gain gainful employment. So I thought about doing it this way for you. Uh, Ten Commandments of the Entrepreneur. Um, these are from years of experience in uh, entrepreneurial venture-backed companies and as a venture capitalist back in companies. So let's just go through these. Um, an entrepreneur never quits, no matter what. They are indefatigable, tireless, indestructible, uh, positive attitude, simply never gives up. That is a, probably the single greatest attribute of an entrepreneur. Um, every day they do the impossible with uh, no resources and go beyond the above the call of duty. There was a TV show in the 80s, if any of you remember MacGyver, it's a MacGyver project every day. Uh, fear of failure. Um, uh, I was telling a story today about Jack Welch, who early in his career at General Electric blew up a plastics plant and was promptly promoted. And that was an environment that accepted failure by those who took calculated risks and rewarded it. And uh, it's a great notion. Entrepreneurial companies and entrepreneurs do not have a feel of fa fear of failure. If you're afraid to fail, uh, don't try to be an entrepreneur because it comes with the territory. Seeking the wisdom of elders. Uh, all of you in this room have great professors here. In my life, I've sought out a great many mentors. I got a lot of good advice. Good entrepreneurs constantly look for uh, individuals who can help them in their careers or in the science or whatever it is they're up to and give them advice about their uh, business all the way through. Boards of directors serve that role for corporations, but each of you as an individual is responsible for your own career, and so you should seek uh, at all times starting now to find uh, mentors and elders who have gone before you can share their insights. The entrepreneur sees over the horizon. The great entrepreneurs, and I was uh, privileged, uh, a guy named Bob Swanson, who was the founder of a little venture-backed company called Genentech, was an, a mentor to me. And people like Bob could literally see over the horizon. The great entrepreneurs knew what was coming before anybody else knew what was coming. And to kind of quote the great hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, it was really easy. You just had to skate to where the puck was going to be. The great entrepreneurs knew where the markets in the world were going, and they got there first. Five more since this is the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt know your customer and distribution channel. Uh, in any business, it doesn't matter what it is, you have a customer or a client that you have to serve. You need to never, ever, ever lose focus of what it is the customer wants from you as a business person. And the distribution channel is simply the way in which you get your product out into the marketplace. You need to understand how that works. Often people get the customer piece right and the distribution channel wrong. You need to know both. That is, who your customer is and how to get your product through to them in the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit more some of this later on. 
frugal with your funding as a venture capitalist. This is near and dear to my heart. Every entrepreneur has X amount of capital. It's a finite resource like the air we breathe. You need to uh, get your project done with the amount of money you've got. And the best entrepreneurs get an amazing amount done with a relatively small amount of capital and constantly think about preserving capital and the investors who back them. And that is what they uh, work for every day. To covet the engineering solution over the customer needs. So many of you in this audience are in the engineering school. This is not meant to be a derogatory comment, just an observation. Um, there are great engineering and technological fixes to all kinds of problems. Those may or may not be the answer the customer really wants. And in many companies, big and small, you see again and again and again, the company comes up with a great engineering or technological fix to a problem, but the customer doesn't want it. And so this is the point, is to always understand the customer need. There's a simple principle called KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, if you follow that one in general, you're usually going to take care of your customers pretty well. Don't make it too complicated. Seeking all possible funding sources. I heard today the university's um, uh, energy group got a grant. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of federal money running around out now. There's nonprofit organizations. There's venture capitalists. There's, there's your friends and your neighbors and your family. Great entrepreneurs uh, have ways to find capital, and they're tireless about finding funding sources. If they get somebody trapped in an elevator for five minutes, they make the pitch. And you never know what comes from that. So you need to really be ambitious in the way that you find money. And the last part is really, is really true of great entrepreneurs. They're in it for the ride. Great entrepreneurs, and I know several who have made billions of dollars in their lives, and you might say after you made your first few billion, you take it easy. The true entrepreneurs, they're in it for the game. <coughs> and they will get back up and try another company again because they just love the adventure of building a great company. And so it should be fun all along the way. In the early days of Genentech, there are legendary stories. People used to release pigs into our ho-ho parties. They would take somebody's favorite car, tow it away, crush it in the lot, put a crushed car back in the same spot for when the person came back as a practical joke. There's a lot of fun in really energetic, high-tech companies. And it should be fun at all times. Uh, and that's part of exulting in the journey. OK, so then I thought I'd, I'd tell you, entrepreneur, what's uh, a great company? If some of you want to join a company instead of starting your own company. What are some of the characteristics of a great entrepreneurial company? They're often, <coughs> at least in the technology world, founded on a fundamental breakthrough technology. Apple, I think you guys don't know the story of Apple. A young guy named Steve Jobs was wandering around Stanford. There's a place called Xerox Park, which is a research place. And they had this device there that now you know of as the mouse that they didn't know what to do with. So he borrowed the mouse from Xerox Park. He got a little personal computer together and really single-handedly created the personal computer industry as you know it. Genentech was a company founded on the dream of recombinant DNA technology, technology that was created kind of in the mid-70s by a couple of professors here in California, one at Stanford and one at Berkeley. And it was, it, it was founded on the notion of recombinant DNA technology and everything you could do with that. I think you guys all know the Google story, a couple of bright young Stanford PhD students who had a better algorithm, algorithm for internet search, and you know what happened from there. Intel was kind of a third generation, a team of people that had been at Fairchild Semiconductor and before one company that and found a better way to make semiconductor chips and uh, you know, Intel, you know. Microsoft, a young long-haired character who dropped out of Harvard, played a lot of poker, didn't make it through his freshman year, got together with a bunch of other young kind of crazy guys and started writing code and um, Microsoft. So those are the technologies that the company started from. There are lots and lots of examples like that, but they start with some core fundamental technology that's usually uh, a really great breakthrough and unclear what you're going to do with it. What's another characteristic of all these companies? Um, surprising, I was talking about this today. When we put a man on the moon, the average age of the engineer sitting in mission control in Houston was 28 years old. It is young people like yourselves who don't know what you can't do, who do the impossible in these kinds of companies. And all of them, including Google most recently today, have the ability to track the most exceptional young people because, frankly, it is young people and your energy and enthusiasm that makes all these great companies go in the beginning. Genentech was the same. Now, my peer group at Genentech, I've been out of there a long time, are still relatively young people in their 40s and 50s now. They were in their 20s and early 30s when they got the great accomplishments done there. I talked about risk-taking and innovation. And you have to inculcate that as a culture. So all of these great companies somehow create a marvelous culture in the beginning that makes them sustainable and entrepreneurial over a long period of time. I think two parts of that culture are K 
calculated risk taking, the ability to really go out and do what can't be done and not be afraid to fail and to innovate, to just do the next thing. Again, it's, it's uh, the reason I think young people are so successful <laughs> is you're not old enough to know what you can't do, so you just go ahead and do it. And it's that culture of risk taking and innovation that's really, I think, a touchstone of, of great entrepreneurial companies. Target to create huge markets, I think that's obvious. All the companies in this example either created from scratch brand new whole markets or they took the technology they had in the case of Genentech and went after ultimately the pharmaceutical industry. And typically in these companies there is a truly dynamic, you might even say messianic leader who takes that company forward, a uh, person who has all the characteristics of the Ten Commandments of the Entrepreneur and probably more. i give you some examples here. Steve Jobs is Apple, Michael Dell is Dell Computers, Bob Swanson was the Genentech founder, Andy Grove at Intel and Bill Gates I think some of you have heard of. Truly inspired individuals who will do whatever it takes to succeed in an entrepreneurial environment. Typically there's a leader like that in these companies. Okay, I, I'm going to just do three slides. Um, I talked to you about the people and the companies. Intellectual property is what it's all about. So what, what do you own? What is it that makes you successful is intellectual property. And I just, these are some slides. You can read these. But in America, <coughs> when you have a great technology company, you create intellectual property, the product of the human mind. That is what you own, and that's what gives value to the business. Without the underpinnings of the legal system that gave rise to intellectual property, you wouldn't have any of these technology companies because you wouldn't be able to own what you created. So these are the characteristics. There's four pieces of intellectual property. I'm going to talk about two of them, which are most relevant for technology companies. One is patents. It's actually in the United States Constitution. For any of those who happen to be constitutional scholars in the room, you'll find in Article II, uh, patents, the creation of patents actually was written by the Founding Fathers into the United States Constitution. It covers physical creations, so those things that you can touch and feel, although now they're actually business process patents. I'm not sure the founder said that in mind, but you can patent business processes as well. Three characteristics of a patent. It has to be novel. Nobody ever thought of it before. It has to have some fundamental utility. That is, it is a practical and useful thing and non-obvious, meaning that it wasn't just an apparent thing to think of. It's usually that aha moment of inspiration that gives rise to the greatest patents. U.S. patent law was changed in 1995. You now get 20 years of exclusivity from the date of filing. It is a constitutionally guaranteed monopoly. So uh, in an old example of that, um, Polaroid instant cameras was a technology invented by a guy named Land. They, he had broad patents on the notion of Polaroid technology. The codex sued him. Judges said, you have an absolute monopoly. You have the right to practice monopoly under your technology under a patent for the period of time. And the public policy notion behind that is once the patent expires, then everybody has the right to practice it. But for a period of time, you are rewarded by your inventive genius by an exclusive, exclusive market monopoly guaranteed by the law, administered by the patent office. The other relevant piece of intellectual property for high technology companies is trade secrets and know-how. These are secrets. You don't tell anybody. They work by keeping them absolutely secret. The best example I've got up here is the, co the formula for Coca-Cola. By legend, it's stored in a bank vault in Atlanta. Two living people at a time know what the formula is, and nobody else knows. And Coca-Cola has effectively protected the secret of Coca-Cola for almost a century now, and they've kept it that way as a trade secret. And so a lot of... Um, Actually, industrial espionage is all around uh, hiring and trying to steal people's secrets, but this is the other way in the, in the high-tech industry you protect your intellectual <laughs> property. Okay, I'm going to switch gears to the middle part of the talk for you, the current startup environment. Now, everybody, you, you, those of you who read papers are certainly on the web and The Economist. It's a pretty ugly world out there right now. We'll get through this. Um, what's going on in the, in the financing world? Um, traditional funding sources, which is myself as a venture capitalist, have become more scarce. The good news is for entrepreneurs and for a lot of these young companies, uh, the Obama administration has opened the spigot. The Energy Department is going to give away in the form of grants and loans over the next 18 months some $60 billion in funding targeted towards a variety of industries, particularly on clean energy technologies. Uh, companies are cutting costs dramatically. There's layoffs going on. A real current focus on the bottom line of the business these days with a focus on being profitable companies and, and making positive uh, contribution margins. I'm going to cover these areas later on, but there are a lot of opportunities in this. In fact, some of the greatest companies built were built in times of great crisis when there's intense focus on capital needs and creativity. And I'm going to go through these areas for you at the last part of the talk. And I think that there will be tremendous companies created right now in some of the kind of scariest times we're in. So I'm going to take you through now a bunch of data slides. These are pulled from VentureSource, which reports on uh, 
funding issues for the, for the in, um, venture capital industry. What you've got here is a chart. These are dollar flows by year into the venture capital industry in the United States. So for those of you who remember the tech bubble in 2000, take a look. Uh, people are rational economic maximizers. When the tech bubble was booming along, you had a record $84 billion in that year into venture capital, dwarfs all the rest of the years. 2001, the tech bubble blows up and the dollars fell off the face of the earth. We slowly started climbing back out of it. Last year at $25 billion. This year in the first quarter, dollars flowing into venture capital firms was down more than 50% from last year, which you can see was already a relatively off year. So the funding sources, at least in the venture capital industry, have been significantly imperiled. So this is uh, deal flow. These are, so each, this is um, categories of, of deals. So as you can see, information technology, which is the IT, by, by numbers of deals over the last uh, in nine years or so has been pretty steady, about 50 to 60 percent of all deals that get financed in the information technology area. Healthcare has been pretty steady at the bottom, as you can see, around 25 to 30 percent. If we switch, um, now this is, these are dollars versus numbers of deals, and you take a look here. The, the category at the top in the pink or purple, energy and utilities, that's largely clean tech. And so what you can see as a category from 2001, where it's really not on the chart, until now 13% of all the dollars, dollars funded into venture-backed companies last year were into energy and utilities. But this is really clean technologies, and I'll, I'll cover some of that more. So a real trend of capital towards clean tech. This will continue. It will be accelerated by the Obama administration's efforts. And as you can see, correspondingly, some of the other areas have dropped off. Um, by round class. So in a venture-backed company, you have seed money, which is the very bottom small amount there. And then you have a, a first and second, third subsequent financing rounds. So these are deal flows um, by, the, by the round class. More relevant is this following slide. This is really the dollars. So what you can see, which is probably not a surprise, your seed funding, which is your startup money, is the tiny little bar at the very bottom, 1% or less in all cases going back for the last 10 years because those are small dollars. That's $100,000 or $500,000 to get your company started. By dollars, the later rounds, the, when the companies become more mature, is where the dollars are really attracted to the companies at that point, spending a lot more money, and that's where the largest part of the dollars go in. This is, by the way, all U.S.-based uh, venture data. Geography. So the good news for those of you sitting in California, if you look at this chart, just under 50% of the dollars funded in the United States into venture capital go to California. As you can see, the Bay Area by far has the biggest share of that. That is a long-term trend that has continued over probably 20 years. A simple reason for that is the largest number of venture capitalists happen to also be in California. A lot of them don't like to fly and drive too far, so they just start companies in their own backyard. But the good news for you guys here is that California is a, it gets a huge disproportionate amount of venture capital. It's historically been a very innovative state. A massive amount of federal money is coming into the state of California. And so for innovative startup companies, you are already living in the right state. Okay, so uh, how do you as an entrepreneur and we as venture capitalists make money? There's two ways. You take your company public on the stock market and you ultimately sell the stock to investors to the stock market or you sell your company in what's called a merger and acquisition, M&A. This chart simply shows over the last decade <coughs> the distribution of, of total um, exits between initial public offerings, that's the first time of selling your stock to the public, and M&A. As you can see in the peak in the bubble, 99 and 2000, there was a lot of um, IPO, public uh, stock activity that dropped off the face of the earth in 2001, 2002, and the bubble burst. It slowly climbed back, and in 2008, it was almost non-existent. 2009 will be worse, so that the only way that we uh, investors and you entrepreneurs get paid back is the M&A exit. So let's see what that looks like. Well, unfortunately, that's also going down. M&A um, activity, merger and acquisition, dropped off dramatically last year. It's going to be worse in 2009. So uh, this is a chart of the uh, paid, dollars paid. Um, and what's important for, again, you as an entrepreneur and myself as an investor is the difference between the um, line graph in the blue and the, and the bar graphs below. <coughs> what you want to do is have what happened in 2000, which is the multiple between the dollar paid and the dollar invested is the highest. It was 10 to 1 there. Uh, five, 4 or 5 to 1 as recently as 2007, dropping back off. In the tough years for all of us, like 2002 and 2003, where you're lucky enough to sell your company, you're barely getting paid back more than the money put in. 
When that happens, I promise you the venture capitalists are first in line to cash the check, and you, the entrepreneur, actually get very little. The age of the companies uh, is also, these are venture-backed companies, only in the United States has gone up, as you can see. Historically, it's been kind of in the three, two, three, four-year range. It's crept up quite a bit. This is a time of the life of the company before it gets sold. The story is the same on the IPO front here. Um, IPO activity, as I mentioned, has dropped off dramatically. You, these are venture-backed companies into IPOs. And the um, time to liquidity, which is the time from starting the company to having the initial public offering, as you can see again, has gone from kind of three years to eight years. And so the, the companies are being sticking around for a lot longer. They're taking more capital. The investors are not getting their money out, and therefore they're not cycling the money back into new companies. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch gears to the third part of the talk. Um, there's lots of opportunity out there, uh, all kinds of things that venture capitalists are interested in. I'm a life sciences investor, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of granular detail on life sciences. These are the macro things you are looking for as uh, an entrepreneur. Remember I mentioned big markets. So here's some global population trends for you. You can see them. The world is getting older. Uh, you've got projections here between uh, last year and 2025, in particular the industrialized, wealthy northern hemisphere, the United States, Japan, and Europe, is getting much older. There will be a demand for all kinds of health care for people as we age, and it's an affluent society that will be able to afford it. In addition, in the United States in particular, the percent of our total gross domestic product that's going to health care has been on a steady, linear climb. You can read the numbers for yourself. I will tell you the United States stands alone in this regard. Most, in fact, all of the other countries in the industrialized world spend about half as much of their gross domestic product on health care as the United States. But these are the numbers here. And as long as the United States keeps spending this kind of money, um, there will be opportunities. This is, this is why in the Obama administration there's a huge push on reducing the cost of health care in this country because this is a drag on all businesses. Good for investors, uh, bad for the business in general. So what are we dealing with from a disease standpoint? Uh, on the left, you have the leading causes of death in 2005 in the, in the United States. Uh, I have a global number for you in 50, uh, 25 years out. It's basically the same problem. So we know the diseases that we face as, as life science investors. We know the challenges ahead of us. They aren't going to change, uh, but they're still going to be there to be addressed, and we need to find solutions. So in the life sciences world, for those of you who might be interested in that, uh, here are some fearless projections about what will be promising areas for the foreseeable future. In the first, um, you've probably seen there's a big push in the Obama administration for electronic medical records. Uh, the uh, system of tracking and storing your records as a patient is archaic. It's 19th century. You go into a doctor's office, they have all these crusty old paper files. and uh, too many bad things happen to human beings in this country because we have a woeful system of keeping track of basic medical records. There's going to be a huge push in this administration to update this and go electronic, and that will give rise to many, many, many opportunities that cross over between the information technology side, the software and the hardware, and the algorithms, and the healthcare piece, which is the data records themselves. A lot of other things that are interesting. Um, uh, you've got a great nanotech center here at Santa Barbara. The advent of a lot of modern materials have given rise to amazing new medical devices, small, tiny devices. There's a camera now you can swallow. They'll take pictures of your intestines as it goes through your body. Uh, uh, advances in technology for implantable devices in the heart and tissues. Some really interesting things in the medical device arena, uh, accelerated by uh, material science and nanotechnology advances. Medical imaging, another really fascinating area where uh, a lot of advances, again, going on here at your school will, will let us be able to take a much better picture of you at the human level, at the tissue level, down to individual cells, what's going on and what's wrong with you. And then genetic testing, you've probably heard of 23andMe. The founder of that one happened to be married to one of the founders of Google. It's handy to have a good financial sponsor if you want to start a company. But 23andMe is all about kind of doing your own DNA testing and figuring out what diseases you're most likely to get. And there's a lot of this going on now. And what will happen beyond the basic work is you'll really know what to do with the genetic information besides just um, putting a nice pretty chart on your wall. My world, which is really the drug development world, they had the Human Genome Project uh, in 2000 in the Rose Garden. President Clinton uh, introduced uh, the two people in the race, uh, Francis Collins at the NIH, and a guy named Craig Venter who happened to have been my pharmacology professor in graduate school on the private side. The two of them raced and we cloned the human genome. 
As a consequence of that now, we have access to all this genetic information that will be a great aid to the discovery of uh, large molecules, uh, sorry, uh, pharmaceuticals in the future. Uh, and, and there are really two kinds of pharmaceuticals, the little pills that we've always taken most of our life, which are what are called small molecules, and then much more so now natural biological molecules. Those are proteins and DNA from your body that are drugs in and of themselves, and there will be a lot of advances there. The U.S. Uh, healthcare system, I think, is ripe for reform. Again, there's a huge political push for that. Anytime there's a seismic shift or a change in government policy, there's an opportunity for entrepreneurs. And so um, here, in, as we go through what will probably be real healthcare reform over the next few years, there'll be a lot of opportunities as the whole healthcare system uh, is uh, checked from top to bottom. Okay, switching gears now, the rest of this will be more technology-based. I, I think probably most of you know, cloud computing uh, is the simple notion that uh, you're not sitting on a computer in your home anymore, or your laptop, you are out on the web uh, in the cloud as the picture goes. And the notion is that um, uh, uh, software and hardware are commodities now. Uh, the few dominant players, the opportunities for innovation, that are long since over. Uh, you can use the internet to access um, basically infinite storage and compute capacity for free, essentially, the cost of your bandwidth or your wireless access. And um, we're still continuing to generate just petabytes of information as we go along in this thing. Storage costs drop. And so there'll be a lot of new companies built around um, computing in the cloud, which is doing computational processes not on your local computer but out in the ether. And all kinds of companies are under this whole new cloud computing notion. It's one of the hot buzzwords in the venture world. So um, the web, uh, <laughs> most of my life there was no web. Um, the first generation of the web, which was kind of, you know, ended around 2000 when the bubble blew up, was a lot of companies that got you under the web and a bunch of gee whiz things. It was all about traffic and metrics around usage. There were no good business models. And so when the tech bubble blew up, a whole lot of companies died or remade themselves. The version of the web we're in now, they just is called euphemistically Web 2.0, the second coming of the web. We now have ubiquitous broadband access, which is different from the first time, so you can get on uh, fast and cheap. Um, traditional media is under siege. Television shows, newspapers, as you know, are dying off, and it's all because all the content is going to the web, and more and more people simply digest everything uh, from the web instead of the traditional media sources. There are a lot of opportunities there for business. The current Web 2.0 business model is an advertising-driven model. So you attract people to your website for whatever it is they're doing, unless you happen to be selling pornography, which you can charge a lot of money. You have to get somebody else to pay for it because all of you in this room assume that the Internet is free to you, even though it's not really true. And so the business model works as sponsors pay for the advertising, all that pop-ups and the spam you get, and that's the, that's the Web 2.0 model. The Web 3.0 model, which is still over the horizon, is one of mobile devices, which I'll touch on in a second, but the web will be pushed to you through your Blackberry or your cell phone or your iPhone or whatever it is, and you will consume most of your web-based information on a small portable device. And th there are a lot of applications going to make that work for you, uh, from wireless and broadband access to um, Apple, uh, and Blackberry's just opened up their app shop to have applications for your mobile devices. And that sinks into mobile devices, which is a huge new area uh, for investment and for companies. For about 20 years, the Wintel duopoly, which was Windows, Microsoft Windows, and Intel semiconductors ruled the world. And it was kind of an ever-escalating nuclear arms race. Uh, they made a faster semiconductor chip that made your computer go faster. Therefore, you could load more software. Um, Bill Gates sold you more software. It slowed your computer down. You needed a faster chip. And on and on it went. And those two companies made a lot of money for a long time in the Wintel duopoly. Um, now that's all a commodity. As I, as I said, you can get compute power effectively for free. You can get it in the cloud through broadband access. So the day of the, you know, the, the personal computer on your desk is largely over. Where the world is going is to small mobile devices. Everything is smaller and faster. And so you've got, again, the, the iPhone is just a brilliant device. I mean, that was really a quantum leap, I think, in a technology that made it really simple for the user to use it. You have now all kinds of companies springing up simply to do individual applications for the iPhone. Each one of those is a company. And I'm sure you guys have downloaded iPhone apps and use them for all kinds of things. Again, BlackBerry is trying to compete with them. Um, we've, we've looked at a very interesting company called Vigo, V-I-I-G-O, that's doing apps for the BlackBerry. And so there's, there's lots and lots of these companies out there. 
And on the other side of this new duopoly, you have the mobile carriers and then the providers, Google and Yahoo, are fighting and Microsoft to own your portal to the web. And so that's where uh, this world has gone. And it, this will be a, a new area for at least a decade or more of interesting companies and technologies. Clean tech. So let's spend a minute on this one. Um, five years ago, nobody even talked about it. There was an environmental movement in the 70s. There's Earth Day. There's all that stuff. And then we've had these oil shocks. But, but we never as a country really got too serious about this until uh, a guy who, um, as he likes to say, always was the next president of the United States. And you know, there were, he thought there were two outcomes. One was you win and one was you lose. And then there was that third version. That was Al Gore. So after he uh, lost by a vote of five to four in the United States Supreme Court, he said to go do something else with himself. He took his PowerPoint presentation. He ran around the world. Uh, and he did the uh, show that's the inconvenient truth. And I think Al Gore gets a lot of credit for changing the perceptions of not just this country, but the world about climate change, global warming, carbon dioxide emissions. And so um, there's also been a political change. I think we all followed the last election. And there's the political will in this country, which did not exist in the prior administration, to either deal with carbon dioxide emissions. There is a big conference in Copenhagen in December where the world's going to get together and I believe agree on a global strategy for combating global warming, particularly carbon dioxide emissions. The United States is likely to adopt, not this year, but next year, a cap and trade system, where if you are a large producer of carbon dioxide, you're going to have to pay for that. There will be a marketplace for carbon dioxide in which people who sequester carbon dioxide or find another way to take it out of the environment will get paid by the people who pollute. And all of this is a huge, a huge, huge fundamental shift in, this, in the structure of the country and of business. And as an entrepreneur, you want to find these things and you want to ride the front end of those waves like you do out here on the beach. So long term, we're going to have issues about food use, energy use, water usage. But right now, it's all around clean technologies, ways to reduce the carbon footprint, the individual carbon footprint. As a side note, I think the real problem is the global population. Unless we can solve that and get the population of the planet down to a couple billion people, we're always going to be looking for the technological fix for the next problem. The good news is you guys will have jobs. Uh, the bad news is I don't think we're really addressing the fundamental cause of what we've got going on. OK, so with the political commentary out of the way, w where are there specific opportunities in clean technology? And you, again, are really privileged to have several centers here on the UC Santa Barbara campus dealing with energy and the environment, the Nanotech Center, and some of the best scientists in the world right here on campus doing things in this area. The energy sources are listed here. There are dozens and dozens of companies backed by venture capitalists today going after all of these, with the exception of nuclear, which is a high capital cost, but the rest, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, some fascinating stuff in the geothermal area of just drilling down a few thousand feet into the ground. You have a perpetual source of heat to make steam. But there are lots of different ideas, and all of these are around um, low-cost sources of, of uh, non-fossil fuel energy. The, the electric grid in this country will be changed, so you take the power lines to the energy sources. That's an issue. And nuclear power is a huge debate. I think that nuclear power in this country will be a part of the solution, although probably not most of it. On the water side, huge issue. We all live in California and kind of watch the drought, third year of the drought. Water usage storage will be a continuing crisis as the population grows. We're not cutting our water usage so far, so we have to deal with sources of that, including desalination, which right now takes a tremendous amount of energy. And so there will be a lot of companies built around, again, usage purification of water. Building design is another really cool area. There's a guy in San Francisco, Bill McDonough, who's a cutting edge green building guru. And they use all the modern tools and technologies and make buildings um, lower carbon footprint, lower energy usage, more uh, light levels, better places for you to work instead of old uh, artificial lit classrooms like this, places where they're enjoyable. A lot of very interesting things going in building materials and building design, building usage. And there's a lot of government incentives, as I mentioned. The stimulus bill was passed, it's $800 billion. I'm sure we're not done. The Department of Energy has taken the lead, but a lot of uh, different um, parts of the federal government as well as state governments are putting a huge amount of money into um, grants and loans and outright uh, gifts for people to start companies up. OK. So I'm going to finish with the best idea you ever heard. Um, if you, this is the hairy future, if you want to combine everything you know into making yourselves true gazillionaires, you can take material science, biology, technology applications, everything that you know, and put them together. And if you can solve this problem, 
you will ultimately succeed in life, and I guarantee you a lot of money out of this one. With that, I'll close and take questions. So I have a class with uh, Robin Campbell uh, from of Aventus. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, life sciences course. And basically, one of the recurring themes is the myriad reasons why biotech is unprofitable. And so, uh, but do you think, like, with the influx of federal money and kind of a move for basically first world uh, healthcare models from to, or to preventative medicine and uninvasive means of treatment and diagnosis, do you think they can actually see some profitability in the near future? Okay, so, so the question is, um, the current model of life sciences biotech is broken. I agree with that, by the way. And then are there new advances that will change um, that model? Um, yes and no. Uh, um, a lot of the diagnostics things that I mentioned will be really game changing for people to figure out when diseases are coming so you can treat them in advance, lifestyle alterations. A lot of the genetic testing, that information will be useful. I talked about medical devices where there could be a lot of breakthroughs. The problem on the drug side, um, it, for which there is not currently a solution, is the Food and Drug Administration. It's a regulated industry. The government has made it harder and harder and harder to get a new drug approved. The costs, you, you pick a number, it's about a billion dollars when you include failures to get a new drug approved. And unless until we change the dynamic by which the government regulates and approves new drugs, which we have not addressed, that part of the equation is not yet solved. I'm probably the uh, youngest person in here who doesn't know the answer to this, but uh, would you describe a little bit how the venture capital industry uh, operates in a practical sense? Absolutely. I, I, and I was, I was counsel in advance that you guys all knew Venture 101, so I avoided that, but thanks for asking because I wasn't so sure. So, so venture capital industry, um, we are a middleman, as it were. Um, we, we get our money from lots of sources. They're large buckets, but pension funds like the California uh, CalPERS, California uh, Public Employee Retirement System, so big pension plans, university endowments, private foundations, in some exceptions, very high net worth individuals, usually from organizations that pool retirement funds. So they will, they will allocate their funds the way you would allocate your personal finances, and they will allocate typically 2 to 5 percent of their total money towards what's called private equity, which is venture capitalists and the buyout guys who are now out of favor. And so, but that's a huge pie, trillions and trillions of dollars for which we get a couple of percent. And so we take our money from those pension funds who in turn get their money from you in the audience. We then uh, screen the entrepreneurs and, and pick individual entrepreneurs and back them with investments and sit on the boards of directors and hopefully help those companies to be successful, build themselves up, and either go public or get sold successfully. And then we recycle that money back to those limited partners hopefully making returns back for them, for the pension plans back, it circles it back around, and uh, that's how we work. And we, uh, you typically raise a fund that lasts for about three or four years, so enough money to invest for a period of three or four years with capital to follow on and protect that company over a period of time. I showed you the kind of six to eight year life cycle. So you raise the funds and invest it usually in three or four years. The funds typically have a 10 year life cycle. It's usually extended by a year or two, and that's to take care of the kind of eight to 10 year life cycle of the companies you invest in. A typical venture investment, it varies by category. <coughs> a typical information technology company um, might take 30 to $40 million of capital total from four to five venture firms, so six to $8 million per firm. They tend to do these in groups together. The biotech life sciences companies, because we can easily spend three or $400 million in a company trying to develop a drug, will raise 100 or $200 million of private capital. Uh, the clean tech models so far as early days, they're raising massive amounts of capital to go into building big pilot plants and adventures like the corn ethanol system. Uh, software companies have historically been low capital usage, so it depends a little bit um, by sector how much money you put into these companies. Is that quick? Historically, the returns for venture capitals that we do, it's called an internal rate of return, an IRR. For those of you who aren't finance folks, that's kind of like an interest rate. Uh, his historically, until the last trough, venture firms returned 20 to 30 percent annual returns. So we were considered high risk, high return capital. Again, if you're a big pension fund, you'd put some money in bonds, some money in stocks. We were considered the most risky, but also the highest returning part of the portfolio. So historically, venture firms returned 
you know, 20, 30% a year on the investment in exchange for the risk that they took. That has not worked in the last 10 years. In fact, the venture industry is under siege largely because we've gone now through two troughs where I showed you the numbers, we have not made that much money. And so the venture capital industry as a whole is under some stress right now because we have not as an industry returned the kind of returns historically that we return in exchange for the risks that we take. So let's see. We, I will tell you that my group has continued to return nicely for our investors, but it's been a hard game. Bill, I think you have one right in front of you there. Um, I'm curious to know about what you think about the current trend of venture philanthropy and, and investments in um, socially enterprises, both internationally and, and in the U.S., if this is just sort of a trend, if this is something that's going to be continuing. Just some thoughts on that. So venture philanthropy, um, it, uh, I guess I wouldn't call it a trend. There are two uh, groups that I know of that are very active in this area. Google, about two or three years ago, created the separate Google nonprofit with a lot of money to... Um, give to good causes. And it's early days, and they've got some very bright people running it. And uh, let, you know, let's see, everything Google's done so far has been right. There's a small uh, Bay Area group, a friend of mine actually helps run it, that invests um, on behalf of um, individuals uh, into venture firms like my own, but all of the gains go to nonprofits. So that's a different model. And that's worked for a long time, uh, very successfully. Um, they have access to really good venture capital firms, and they take the gains, and they, they plow it back in. In general, though, um, there is not much venture philanthropy. Rather, it works as follows. Bill Gates is probably the poster child. An individual like Bill Gates or Michael Dell or War Warren Buffett make a lot of money as an entrepreneur, and at some point in their life, they decide that they're going to give it back to the world. And they then set up a personal foundation, which is what Bill Gates did with his dad, and that foundation gives to charity... Uh, personal wealth. That's much more the model than really venture philanthropy is not something that I think really exists in this country today, nor may it ever, but let's see. You mentioned that there is uh, the new du duopoly of low-cost internet wireless um, or internet access and low-cost uh, wireless providers like cell phones such as the iPhone mm -hmm. or whatever. How long do you think it will take for the applications to be reaching a point of like saturation where there's too many not profitable? That's a very good. So the question was, uh, for all the mobile devices out there, how long will it take to saturate the applications that people use? Uh, you know, uh, in, one, in one sense, there's always the next killer app, is what the tech guys say. So m maybe there's, maybe think about Google for, as an analogy, right? There was search, there was Ask Jeeves, there's a ton of search. Google showed up kind of late in the game. They obviously did search way better than the first guys, so they now basically own search. I think the analogy is reasonable in that there's always some next great application for your device that you can come up with. But I think, the, the, if you will, the golden days are going to be over the next five or ten years, probably the next five years, where they're going to just be a flood of applications to turn your little handheld device, instead of just the things it does, and the iPhone is brilliant what it can already do, into really a completely fully functional device for anything you can possibly imagine. So, so I think most of those apps are going to be developed in the next five years or so, but I think there'll always be some great killer app beyond that that somebody will think of. It's, you're only limited by your imagination. Hi. Um, in your opinion, which clean energy source will probably be the most profitable for uh, venture firms? So the question is uh, clean energy source. So far, the data are actually compelling. Uh, wind power is the only currently profitable alternate energy source without government subsidies. Uh, and it's fairly profitable so that you can put up a wind plant and finance with traditional project financing and make a return on that. No other alternate energy source today is profitable without subsidies, including solar. In fact, Germany is the huge solar uh, kind of innovative marketplace because the German government has mandated solar and has, has incented it through all kinds of uh, rebates. Over time, as these industries build up and more consumers switch over to the alternate energy sources, I think several of them will become profitable. And that's the venture capitalist's risk, right, is to back some business that isn't profitable today that you sure hope is going to be profitable in the future. Uh, I think that some of the geothermal plays are really fascinating because they um, 
uh, kind of, it's a single, uh, you can use old fashioned oil drilling technology, you drill a hole in the ground, at a certain level below the surface it's always hot all the time, you pump water down there and cycle. And there's a lot of interesting innovations there and the beauty of that is that you can put the power source where you need it. So instead of running, the problem with most of the rest of these, the problem with the wind farms, the West Texas, the wind blows all the time apparently, I don't know if it's the politicians or the air, but the wind blows all the time. The problem is the power lines don't run to West Texas and so for a lot of these energy sources, if you have to reroute the entire electrical grid of the United States, that's a huge capital cost. In the geothermal, if you want to have a power plant in some remote mine, you just drill down a certain depth and there's your power plant locally on site. So I, I think it's going to vary. Um, I think on some of the biofuels, I think, I think bioethanol is never going to work in this country as a profitable business. because It's already been shown. It just costs too much to grow the crops you need to use it. So I think there are already some clear losers in this game. Most of it, it the jury is out. Nuclear, if you took away the uh, public stigma and the kind of regulatory hurdles, nuclear uh, is, abs is profitable from time zero for a project finance basis, but you've got the other issues that go along with it. So wind today is the only one, with the exception of nuclear, which there's been no new nuclear plant permit in the United States in 25 years. Uh, geothermal, I think, will come, and some of the other ones may never get there. You gotta wait for the mic, Tom. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the solar, do you have sort of a BC magic number as to what efficiency needs to be realized by solar panels before they would be profitable? And secondly, it would seem that the VCs would shy away from uh, the solar technologies today. I noticed that there's already been layoffs uh, by many of the companies around the world, and yet there's new power, new uh, solar energy equipment uh, panel makers and equipment makers going on in Vietnam and in Japan, China, and uh, Korea. So all of these things are seem to be growing on the one hand, but yet the uh, the margins aren't there, as you said. Yep. So, so the questions are kind of broadly about solar power and what are the what are the dynamics if they exist to make solar power profitable? There, there's two parts. Uh, as I understand this, there is some asymptotic efficiency of solar panels that we're actually getting relatively close to it, somewhere around 30 or 35 percent efficiency for for current technologies, uh, rooftop panels, and we're at the really most efficient panels, which are high use industrial, we're maybe at 26, 28 percent. So we're approaching some efficiency curve, but that's on existing technologies, by the way, so I think somebody to come up with a better technology that'll, that'll solve that problem. So we can go further up the efficiency curve for sure, that's a part of it. The other part is just pure supply and demand mass volume, right? Uh, Sun Power was the big Bay Area high flyer early, went public, made a fortune for people, and it's come back off. Um, I, I think when you get much more broad-based usage so that solar panels are on, put on every house or most houses, and every big uh, industrial business like Walmart puts solar on the roofs so that you have huge demand for the panels, what you're gonna do is drive down dramatically the cost, just like look at television sets, right? I mean, uh, you know, 10 years ago, a flat panel TV that was kind of 30 inches was a $4,000 TV, and now you can get a 80 inch flat panel TV for the same $4,000, and what happened there is they built these massive fab plants at billions of dollars a piece, they've got at production volume and scale, and they can just make bigger devices. The same thing is gonna happen with solar, and so as demand increases and there's much broader use, you'll, you'll reduce the cost of installing it. And so for the consumer, what you care about is the break-even point for you to pay to put it on your roof. And I think those two parts of the equation solve it. Greater efficiency and just lower cost of the panels. And we will make, we will absolutely make progress in both of those. And I think that's why venture folks continue to invest in these companies. Uh, when you use solar uh, fumes, there's a lifetime and then uh, does anybody think about uh, when they um, when they are uh, out of their life? What's the what's the um, effect to the environment to dispose those those uh, solar fumes? Like the solar cells. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, so that's a good question. Um, everything has to be recycled. Uh, I don't know that there is necessarily yet an existing good technology for recycling the solar panels. Most of them are only you know, five years or less old. Um, <clears throat> they'll probably have to solve that uh, as all the rest of these things. With every breakthrough, then there's another problem and another solution, which is what makes technology fun. There's always another problem to solve. I, I don't know that I have the answer or the answer is known today for the ability to recycle the solar panels or what they'll do. I'm sure they can recycle some of the component parts. 
a piece of it is that the chemistry, which is these are silicon-based technologies, largely that are in the solar panels, just a thin film of silicon that really is doing the magic. Um, that there'll be innovations in the chemistry and new chemical materials, and so it, it may not make sense to recycle the old uh, panels into the glass is potentially recyclable in the other materials. I'm sure people will come up with that as we get more solar panels. There'll be a business for recycling, but today I, I don't think there is an answer of efficient uh, recycling of the solar panels. Rod Ferguson, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today in Santa Barbara. Thank you, folks.